Okay, everybody, we're gonna get going again. We have a very interesting talk on Russian CPUs by EVM. So, ever give her a hand and uh, take it away. Thanks, everybody. I'm EVM. Uh, my friends call me Ozzy. EVM's just my internet name. Uh, if you're here at Recon, you're my friend, so you call me Ozzy. Um, gonna be talking about uh, the Elbrus architecture today, and uh, Elbrus is named after El the uh, the highest mountain in Russia is Mount Elbrus, so that's the that's the heights of Elbrus reference. Uh, on on here, I've got a uh, link to the the slides and the code on GitHub. So if you have a computer, it and you you it's worth loading up if you want to um, follow along the disassembly that we're going to be. Uh, working through. It's going to be a little bit of a, a fast, uh, technically dense talk, so hang on. Uh, so a little bit about me. Uh, I'm, uh, I work at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, been there for a long time doing embedded reverse engineering. Started in the last couple of years to get more involved in public projects, so you may have heard of uh, All Star, Code Cut. I uh, worked on a project called SimGrate. Uh, with a buddy. Um, in my personal time, I'm, uh, I'm a scoreboard hacker. Uh, so I, I coach uh, baseball uh, for my kids, and I uh, hacked a baseball scoreboard that you can see there and read about in, uh, in POC or GTFO. Uh, I teach 4-H with my wife. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a Jesus follower, uh, so Jesus' words uh, in, in Luke, he says, uh, there's nothing hidden that will n not be disclosed or brought to light, and so that's kind of a, a uh, life verse for me uh, as a reverse engineer. So a little bit about uh, Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. Uh, we are a DOD uh, research center, so we're not feds, but we work with feds. Um, in all kinds of cool areas. So people know us most from uh, spacecraft, so like the, this is the Parker Solar Probe and the uh, New Horizons mission that went to Pluto. Uh, we had people that built the, uh, the COVID dashboard with, with uh, JHU. Um, it's a really neat place. Um, we, we have about, uh, well, really have a lot of interesting national security work um, go, going on. Um, if you're interested in that, uh, please talk to me later. Um, so yeah, let's, let's dive in and talk about Elbrus. Um, Elbrus started out, um, it, it, Elbrus has been around for a really long time. Uh, it's started, uh, launched in 1979 in in Russia, if you're familiar with the history of Russian electronics, there was a lot of cloning of U.S. stuff, but this was fully, you know, Russian indigenous design. Uh, claims to be the first superscalar out-of-order processor developed in Russia. Um, like all other architectures, it's had many different uh, iterations. The current one is called called E2K, uh, which is what we'll be talking about today. In, uh, came out in 2001. It was formerly manufactured by TSMC, so, um, you know, like everybody, ev all other countries, you know, it's actually uh, built in Taiwan. Um, MCST is, uh, is fabulous. Um, the, as far as I could tell, Russia only has 90 nanometer um, manufacturing technology, that's the, the Micron company has that, so that's why they had to s send it out to, um, uh, to uh, TSMC. I, I failed to mention, so the, the company um, that makes Elbrus is called MCST. They, they're, they used to be Moscow Center for Spark Technologies. They don't do Spark stuff anymore, so they're just MCST. Um, there's a bunch of different uh, models we worked this work was on a single core um, models like a little bit slow but but in a PC motherboard and chassis um, used to be able to just buy these things in 
in Moscow and get somebody to send them to you. Um, then due to the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, they um, ended up on the sanctions list. Uh, Taiwan also sanctioned Russia over chip-related stuff. So TSMC ended production completely. Um, and it's, it's really actually, it's, I was looking this up yesterday, it's unclear to me if they're even really manufacturing them anymore because I don't know if they have any viable uh, options to make new ones. Um, I also found out that MCST was acquired by this Rosatom company that does, it's a big nuclear energy company in Russia uh, this year. So if in the future they do stuff, you know, it may end up in, uh, you know, in, in nuclear uh, devices. Uh, if you've paid attention to Elbrus through, you know, the last couple of years, you may have read some of these different stories. There's lots of, whenever there's indigenous processors like this, there's lots of, uh, lots of hype and kind of uh, what, I, what I called hype where one of the original things was in, in 2015, there was this big news that this, um, the, the MOD had ordered a, a big shipment of these ruggedized laptops. It's unclear if that ever actually was delivered or if the military even really used them. I sort of, I, I expect that, um, I expect that the, uh, I expect that I wouldn't be giving this talk if they were heavily used by the military. Um, we, we would be doing something with it, but um, so I, I, I tend to think that it, it was kind of bought for a curiosity and, you know, just stored somewhere that, that they're not really using it. Some, some interesting thing, um, uh, there was this crowd supply announcement um, that you were supposed to be able to buy one of these things like in, a, in an ITX motherboard and um, that basically went nowhere. I don't really know who was behind that. Um, there's this really interesting article recently, uh, last year, about the ba their banking sector, uh, several big banks trying out Elbrus um, to see if they could replace it, you know, with in replace their Intel servers with Elbrus servers. Uh, this wonderful quote here uh, that uh, at the at the moment, Spurbank says, no, we cannot deploy Elbrus machines into our ecosystem, but we are, <laughs> we are pleasantly surprised that it works at all. So that, that could be a, um, that could, could have been the title for my <laughs> talk, pleasantly surprised that it works at all. Um, so what hardware is actually out there? Um, at least, you know, up until recently, you could buy these things directly from MCST. Uh, they they had a heart. They had a catalog. They sold you the the motherboard and the box and everything. Um, they had a couple of different PC options, some server options. Um, before the Russian invasion, they were selling shell accounts. Um, so one of the uh, folks I talked to, he he got access just just by um, you know buying a shell account there. Um, and the thing was that they still, all of their documentation so far has been under NDA, and we'll get into why that's, um, why that drove the research here the way that it did. Um, I, I should point out here, so uh, the, the way that um, I got access to the hardware was basically a, a buddy of mine, um, a, a, a good neighbor who, um, you know, many of you know, uh, happened to, to land one of these things, and he gave me a uh, a shell account on it. So that was um, kind of the genesis of this whole whole project. He did that, all, that was all before, um, it was even prior to uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So this, is a, this work is about uh, two years old at this point. Um, so yeah. Um, if you're dealing with Elbrus on, on a PC, you're you're running Linux. You know that's that's what they do. Um, there's a Elbrus Linux that's produced by MCST. There's also Astro Linux, which is a kind of a Russian uh, national Linux distribution. 
Um, Elbrus, so M MCST has, has for forked, at least internally forked some of the um, uh, you know, common GCC tools, um, bin utils. Um, the, again, their, their documentation is all under NDA. So there's no, no data sheet level documentation that, that I was able to find. Like normally if we're looking at a new processor, we get that data sheet, you know, look at all the instruction coding, encodings, you know, make a Ghidra module, make a, you know, module for IDA Pro or whatever, and we, we can just go to town. Didn't have that for, for this. Um, I, I'd love to get that documentation leaked or find it somewhere, but haven't been able to find it. Best thing that I was able to find is this pro programming guide that's in Russian. So it talks a little bit, it's kind of about like optimization, how to, how to optimize software for, the, for Elbrus. Um, but basically a, um, you know, a Google Translate of this programming guide is kind of the best I had to go with. So this is the, the work you're gonna see is just me kind of poking around on an Elbrus machine trying to figure out what I can learn about the architecture. There is out there on the internet, there's, there's this thing called the Open E2K project, um, which I'm not entirely sure who's behind that. Um, it's, it's a Russian driven project um, and you can see the, the link here. Um, I don't know if that's MCST trying to put some things out there um, to push more adoption or if that's like a separate group. There's some things like um, the Linux kernel source um, you, can, you can look at. Um, they have a, a QMU and uh, bin utils as well. So their version of bin utils, um, the, uh, the, the disassembly that you see in the slides and that's on the GitHub page, that's all from their, from the Open E2K bin utils um, release that I, I was able to patch to get it to, um, not, not patch, but um, get it to compile with a flag that gave me more verbose uh, output. I'll, I'll explain that in a bit. So um, that, that's basically kind of the public information that's out there. Okay, so I had access, I had a shell account on an Elbrus machine and I wanted to explore some, uh, you know, some example uh, exploit, you know, just kind of play around with it and use that to kind of, um, you know, use that to kind of learn the architecture. I didn't have any, you know, interesting uh, Elbrus software to reverse engineer, so I just had to kind of create my own exploit. So I went back to um, something called Smashing C++ V pointers, uh, which is something that Rick's published. Uh, a guy named uh, Rick's or handles names Rick's. Apparently, uh, Rick's is still out there. So gre greetings to Rick's wherever you are. Thank you for publishing this, uh, um, you know, this example way back in the day. Um, this, what, what smashing C++ V pointers is, is it's very similar to, um, to stack smashing, but it kind of makes uh, use of the fact that when you, di when you allocate um, objects in C++, they get you know, allocated on the stack, and then you can overwrite function pointers. And so we'll, we'll get into this a little bit. What's, what's cool about this is that it still absolutely works on, um, uh, you know, on, on Linux and modern compilers. There's a lot of like stack-based, um, you know, mitigations that are out there on, um, you know, on, on Linux especially. Um, you know, your, your no execute and stack canaries and all that kind of thing. Um, but, th but this just, you know, totally still works with some updates. So the first thing I needed to do was update this for, for modern GCC. So when Rick's wrote it, it was like 32-bit x86 GCC. Um, so if you, go to the, if you go to the GitHub page, there is um, bo3.cpp is, is one of the examples Rick's used, and um, you know, it, it's there updated for, for uh, modern x86. Um, so I'm just gonna walk through this real, real quickly. And uh, again, you can check it out on the GitHub, GitHub page afterwards. But um, 
the basic idea is that we, in, we have a, a real simple base class that has a, uh, it has a private, um, you know, a fi private fixed size buffer, and um, it has this, it has two, you know, two child classes here, and this, uh, this print buffer function is declared as virtual. And what that means is that that's basically saying, well, I'm gonna let any, uh, any child class, they can choose to write their own function or they can use the, you know, the parent version. So what happens when that, uh, you know, when, when you create a, a, a virtual function like this is the object that's, that gets created looks like this in memory. There's this, this buffer here, but GCC adds this, uh, this, this virtual function table and this V pointer here that points to it. And it's real simple, you know, in this one we just have one function, so we have a single pointer and a single entry in the V table that points to print buffer. Um, but because this, these, if, if we're allocating them dynamically, they're gonna get allocated on the stack. If we allocate two of them, uh, one after the other, we can overwrite the buffer, or we can, um, writing out of the buffer, the first one, smash into the, the v-pointer of the second one. That's, that's the real basic idea. So this is the, uh, this is the exploit code. I apologize for the, for the eye chart here, um, but again, check it out on, on GitHub afterwards. Um, this is exactly the same as Rix's code, just again, updated for 64-bit um, pointers. Um, in GCC, they've changed where, where the v-pointer um, lives in the object. It used to be at the bottom of the object, now it's at the top, so I had to move that around. Um, and I had to, um, the, the other part was that Rix, uh, in, in, back in the 32-bit days, you could kind of assume that, uh, that pointers didn't have zero bytes in them, so it turns out uh, Rix made that assumption without, um, it, you know, it wasn't a problem. So I had to kind of update this to use a, a um, basically, I, I, I had to introduce a different kind of, of vulnerability that didn't make use of string copy. Um, so all we're gonna do, um, the, um, let me go back here. So basically this is the, this, is, this set buffer function is vulnerable, right? So, and this is where I, it used to be string copy and I, I created this vulnerable mem copy. We're not gonna check this size and we're just gonna overwrite that buffer. Um, so basically this function over here is just, just um, creating the buffer that's going to go into that buffer and write into the, the, into the, the V pointer of the second object. And so here's our exploit code. Um, we're going to just uh, create two objects on the stack. Um, we're gonna call the, call the new function. We're gonna call set buffer with the buffer overflow, or with the buffer that comes back from this function. That's going to overflow the buffer and overwrite the V pointer. And um, then eventually, um, this, this part isn't so necessary, putting a, a valid message in the second object, but basically, um, for this for this first object, the the buffer is overwritten, and for the second one, this is going to actually execute our exploit entry function. Um, the exploit entry function is just a call to printf. It's never going to give you up, and and didn't fit on the slide, but you can see that all again in the GitHub code. So I I got that working on x86, and I. Uh, shelled into the Elbrus machine, um, recompiled it using the, the L++ um, compiler, ran it first time, and, and basically, you know, boom, right here, it worked, like, first time. Um, and I was, uh, at first I was surprised, and then, this, and then when I thought about it, I was like, oh, that's not really that, <laughs> it's not really that crazy because they forked, uh, you know they, they they fork GCC and it's a 
uh, you know, it's a 64-bit architecture. They, they have 64-bit pointers. So uh, it, it wasn't that surprising that it, that it just worked. OK, so now I'm going to dive into the architecture itself and kind of use this, this example to kind of um, you know, il just illustrate uh, information about the instructions and the, and, um, the ISA. So um, Elbrus is kind of weird. It, it's, it's, I've been trying to just, you know, as people have come up to me over the last couple of days, been asking me about like, you know, what it's like. I, I kind of, um, uh, I've explained it as sort of like a living fossil. It's, it's kind of a weird like <laughs> evolutionary offshoot in terms of the, in terms of um, the development of computer architectures. Um, so so it, it, it's 64 bits, but it, it's, it uses this uh, very long instruction word um, architecture. And so very long instruction word is something that you would commonly see in like DSP architectures. And w what that is is when you have a, when you, when you have out of order execution, so like in, in a superscalar pipeline, so think in, in x86, you have these execution units that are executing your instructions in parallel and you have a control unit that's kind of making sure that all, that all, all works in the right order. Um, very long in instruction word allows the the compiler to directly uh, address each execution unit within the ALU, um, and the reason you do that is because your x86 CPU doesn't have a whole lot of context about the whole program that's being run. It it only kind of knows you know a few instructions ahead and behind and that kind of thing. Um, so when you when you give this power to the compiler, then the compiler can really, knowing the full, uh, you know, the, knowing the full idea of what the program's doing, it can, you know, be a lot more efficient with assigning instructions to different execution units. So it's, it's got six, um, six execution units. Uh, the, um, the register set, so Daniel in the last talk brought up um, register windows, and I'm gonna. I, t I told him that I would I would really dive into uh, a, a deep explanation here of, of how uh, register windowing uh, worked. So I'm glad that he brought that up. Um, there's um, there's kind of this general purpose register set, uh, 18 of them, and that part is, is windowed, and we're gonna explain what what that is. There's 32 global registers, so those are not windowed. Those are actually always point to the same thing. And then even within the window, there's this sliding register uh, concept, this, this, um, this B register that, that um, can slide within the window. Uh, it has these width modifiers, so if you think, think like x86, you have you know, AX, EX, AX, EAX, RAX, right? Um, similar thing here, um, but it's it's a little bit weird. So si single is 32 bits, uh, SR0, DR0 is double R0, 64 bits, and QR0 is uh, is is 128. So quad quad register is 128 bits. Um, it also has multiple predicate registers. That'd be familiar to anybody that works has worked with DSPs before. Um, you think in in like x86, you have like one flags register, so you can do one compare, and then you have to use the result of the compare. In um, in, in these kind of architectures, you you actually want to sometimes you want to do multiple different comparisons, and then save the uh, save the results in different registers. So. There's multiple of those predicate registers. There's a so there's a two-step uh, branch and um, control transfer system, which is is really interesting. Um, Going to talk about th that a little bit. Um, and um, there's also this completely separate stack for return addresses and register windowing called the procedure chain stack. Um, one thing that I really wanted to know 
it was how do interrupts and exceptions work? Because that's often a thing, you know, when you're when trying to exploit something, we want to, you know, if we want to get like kernel level execution, that's often something that we want to hook or, um, you know, mess with. And none of that was in the in the public documentation. So you can get a flavor of how it's working based on like how. Um, what, like what the Linux kernel is doing, but I didn't really um, explore that. Okay, uh, so here's the here's the um, the instruction encoding how that works. Um, this is all based on sort of like analyzing the source code of OpenE2K um, bin utils, um, and they're kind of even like there's it's really funny if you look at it. There's like these comments of like. They, they they have somebody had access to to some kind of documentation, but they're they'll be like, you know, in in the comments, it's like I think it worked this way, you know, ha ha ha, like, you know, WTF, MCST, what were you even talking about? Like, so they're kind of <laughs> they're kind of trashing the documentation that's out there as they're as they're writing it. But um, this is what I was able to to pull out of there. So this is just showing you the. Um, Basically, the header symbol. So you have, um, in in with very long instruction word. Instead of just like one instruction, what you have is basically each each instruction has a header, and it tells you how many additional um, additional pieces of this instruction do I need to decode. So this is the the header syllable, and then there can be up to seven more um, syllables. So uh, so you have like up, uh, uh, an instruction can be up to 128 uh, bits long, um, and they're basically just they're basically just alerting you to the presence of other um, symbols um, or, or syllables rather. Uh, so f you know, for instance, like there's bits to say you know we can put up to six ALU instructions here. Um, And so, yeah, th these are basic. These are basically like all the other types of syllables that are possible. Some of these we don't even know. Like I said, a alias, CDS, PLS. We, we don't even know what the what they are for. Um, when I was saying that that it's kind of a living dinosaur, the th the thing I thought that was very interesting. Um, when I was, I was looking at the ALU, like what instructions are actually possible with the ALU, there's not really that, that many. Um, if you've worked on, like, the, the very long instruction word piece is, is kind of very similar to what you might see in, in like a DSP processor, but usually in those processors, you also have like very complicated um, matrix or, or vector processing modes. Um, this processor, like this ALU, looks more risk-like to me. Um, you know, really not that many different um, kinds of operations that that you can do. Um, so it's it, it in that sense, it's it's kind of odd. Okay, so this is the that that print buffer function from the um, from the Rix example, and this is literally just. Showing you, okay, how does a basic uh, register type instruction work? So um, this is the so this is the add add d for add double instruction. Um, I've basically found the this this compile flag that you can enable in bin utils that kind of dumps out the um, the encoding of the instruction and and these syllables, so you can sort of see the he header sy syllable. And then these like two ALU syllables. So basically, we've got two ALU instructions. This is a literal syllable. So this is literally just saying, and, and this is um, it's uh, it's AT and T syntax. So it's it, this is literally just saying we're going to add double. Th this is going to ALU one. We're going to take DR one and add this. Uh, this um, immediate value, which is minus 10 hex, and we're going to store it in 
register 13, and we're actually going to add that <laughs> at the same time. Uh, we're going to add that exact same value to register 1 and store it in register 14, and you do this because like that's, this is actually the most efficient way to put the same <laughs> value in, in two registers. Um, and then here, down here, we're even going to load, so this is going to be, we're going to load double, um, you know, the, the address that's at, at register 13 and store it in register 13, and we're going to do this, you know, in parallel. So that's just a real basic example of a, um, of what sort of parallelized uh, register type instructions look like. Okay, so I mentioned register windowing. Uh, register windowing is it, the way that I think about it, it. It really like broke my brain for a while, and then it, then I kind of hit upon a pretty simple way to think about it. I, I think about it as um, working very similarly to how stack frames work. So if you're if you're familiar, you know, especially like 32-bit x86 days, and you could cl cleanly unwind the stack, um, it, it works very similar to that. The idea is that we have some function. And the idea is that the the register uh, the register set set instead of being fixed, uh, you know, a fixed set of things, it, it the you know it, it it can slide around between functions. So here we have like if we have a function um, function number one, it it would have register zero through you know whatever register. Um, NYS1, and then it's, it's going to have an area that overlaps, a, like a parameter area with the next function, right? It's very similar to how it works with when you have stack memory. And then when you call this function, you're going to, to specify like a, a, new, um, uh, a new base value for the, for the window. Um, in, and then now in this, in this called function, register zero, now points to the base of uh, of that that window, which would be called a different register back in this function. So, like in Daniel's example, there was like call eight, and it's always, you know, the 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 window's always shifted by eight registers. Here, you actually the the call instruction can specify how much you're going to shift that register by. The whole point again is to save you the time so that you're not, you don't have to store all those parameters to the stack. You can just keep them in, uh, you know, you can keep them in the registers and then call the function um, so that that's, it makes it more efficient that way. So this is the, um, where set buffer is calling the vulnerable mem, mem copy and um, just showing you, this is a lot of information, but so you can <laughs> check it out later. Um, the, the um, just looking at this like set WD and set BN function, so set WD is like set the window. Um, and the so this is this is basically just the prolog for set buffer so it's setting it up its own window um, when all of these fields they they have to be quad registers so they have to be like a an even number of double registers that that you use so this is basically saying this sets to um, sets when it says set window window size eight that's basically saying dr0 to dr15, so it's setting up the, the window to be that wide. Um, there's then this, this base register, um, which, gets, uh, which now points to dr8, because it's, it's basically saying the, the base setting is four, which doubled is, is eight. And so that just means that, um, what's cool about this, if you kind of look through the disassembly, that just means that when it's setting up the parameters, it, it just is going to put them, um, it's going to use DB0, which points to register eight to set up the, the parameters, and then it does a call. When it does the call, it sets the, the window base equal to, um, equal to four. Again, that's quad registers, so the mem copy, the new, uh, window for mem copy is going to to start here. So what um, what set buffer would call dr8 is going to be 
dr0. OK, uh, calls and branches. So um, the, way that, um, the way that these work is that there's, a, there's actually two different instructions. So I've never seen this before. Um, there's this disp instruction, um, which basically sets, so we take an address, and we, so this is the address that we're going to call, and we put it in this CTPR1 register, and then later on we call it. Um, and if this was a branch, you, you would see a CT instead of the call. Um, this basically is a thing where they, it allows the pipe, it basically notifies the pipeline that a call is about to happen, and so it can kind of get ready for that, that context switch. Kind of interesting. Um, the call stack. So um, the, um, another interesting thing here is that there's this, you know, so I just explained how the register windowing worked and how calls work. Return addresses and all that register information is stored in a separate stack, you know, separate from, um, you know, the, the regular user stack. And it, it's kind of unclear. So there's these internal registers, um, CR0 and CR1, but it's kind of unclear how those work. Um, and there, there's a sense of that in the, in the Linux kernel code for, for being able to kind of unwind that stack. Um, but it, this is a really interesting place to look because like, uh, you know, like how, how this actually works is, is really, um, you know, probably critical to how the, how the security works on, on Elbrus. Okay. Uh, that's basically all the technical stuff. So, um, future work, I put, <laughs> I put question marks on here because really I think there's so many things that could be done. And as I talk to people and kind of explain this, usually something, probably as you're watching this, something popped in your head of like, I'd really like to know that. And um, there's a lot of places you could go and dig in and lots of like uh, parts of the security that could be explored. Um, I put question marks on here because the future of Elbrus is also uncertain, and it's, real, it's really kind of a question of, like, is this processor architecture going to matter? Um, is it going to become big? It, is, is Russia's isolated from the rest of the world and they have to make their own processors? Will they fab it on some other process? Or will they just, you know, buy Chinese ARM processors or something and... and you know, move on with life. Who knows? Um, so, we'll see. Okay, uh, so I just want to say thanks to uh, my neighbor, uh, my, my good neighbor, who you, you probably all know who I'm talking about, but I'm leaving off the, off the video for his privacy, uh, friend and, and mentor. Uh, really appreciate him uh, giving me access to, uh, I appreciate him, period, and I also appreciate him giving me <laughs> Uh, access to the Elbrus machine. Uh, Moix, um, uh, Brendan from, from NYU, uh, was somebody I bounced ideas off with, uh, so I really appreciate him. Folks back at APL, uh, Molly, Mo, Lynn, Angie, Andrew, Anthony, Rob, Paul, Mike, Ray, Eric, Tim, Megan, Donna, thank you. And uh, just again, uh, thank you to, uh, to Hugo, thank you to all the recon volunteers. Um, Many of you I've, I've met and got to hang out the last couple of days. Uh, it's been a fantastic experience. So thank you very much. Do we, do we have time for, okay, I'm getting the nod. So we, I guess we, ha we have time for one or two questions and I'll also hang around to, um, afterwards to answer. Pure speculation, but do you have any idea why VLIW? I mean, this is around the time of Itanium, but no. It, the question was why? Yeah, why VLIW? I I don't know, and I also know that it didn't start out as VLIW. So that that was added. I forget. It's I, it's in the slides. Is either like, in, in I want to say it was like in the 90s they added it. So 
I, I, I really don't know. I mean, I think it's, VLI, you always add VLIW to try to get more efficiency from the compiler side that you can't do in the control unit. So I'm guessing it had something to do with that. But no, I, I'd love to know. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'd, I, I'd love to know why they, they did it this way. All right, cool. Yeah, thank you all. Uh, we'll uh, see you afterward.